a book which will be published in Australia tomorrow. It's already been published in the United States, where it's been the subject of wide discussion and reviews in Time, Playboy and the New York Times Book Review, among others. Later in the year, there'll be a British edition. What gives Dennis Altman's book its special interest, as compared with much of the academic literature on the subject, is that he writes from his own experience as a homosexual in Australia and in the United States. Dennis Altman's argument is a far-reaching and contentious one. What he says homosexuals want is not just tolerance, but acceptance by the community. He argues that homosexuality is as equally a valid form of human sexuality as is heterosexuality. In the words of the book, that gay is as good as straight. And that, of course, is also the language of the militant homosexual reform movement in the United States known as Gay Lib. Mr. Altman's book itself is, among other things, an analysis of the Gay Lib movement in America, and through this, a personal commentary on contemporary American politics. In his book, Mr. Altman points to the growing gay lib movement in Australia, though here it's probably better known in the shape of Camp Inc., an organisation set up in Australia in 1970 and now claiming a membership of more than 2,000 in all states. <clears throat> to question Dennis Altman, Peter Coleman, joint editor of Quadrant and a Liberal member of the New South Wales Parliament, and the Reverend Roger Bush, Methodist minister and a radio and newspaper columnist in Sydney. Mr. Altman, I'd like to begin by reading to you um, a paragraph from The Australian on June the 24th last. It's about a topical issue. It's about an inquest in Adelaide. It's about alleged homosexuals appearing as witnesses at that uh, inquest. And it's about suggestions that the police sometimes treat homosexuals with rather less than tender loving care. And the quote is this. This week they came forward in their gayest music hall form, lisping and mincing, and in their less obvious but more common persona, straight looking, ordinarily masculine, deeply conscious of identification in our biased society. What's your comment on that paragraph? Well, two things come to mind. The first is, of course, it assumes that all homosexuals are male. And I think we ought to make quite clear from the start that, in fact, there are a very large number of homosexual women. I think it's a reflection of the sexist nature of our society that this is an all-male panel and that it will be, therefore be a very male-oriented discussion. Secondly, it seems to me that that is the level of reporting that, by and large, homosexuals can expect in Australia. That is, it's a level of reporting that plays up every stereotype, every caricature that is generally applied to homosexuals. I very much doubt if it has much relation to the people who actually went into that court. In my experience, which is possibly greater than that of the man who wrote that particular article, most homosexuals don't in fact fit, fit that stereotype. And it seems to me that the final thing one can say about it is it's a very sad commentary on this country that it's taken the for most of the press are even prepared to discuss the question of homosexuality in Australia. <clears throat> Leaving that aside then for the moment, we'll come back I think to some of those issues mm -hmm. later on. To come to your own book, your own story, uh, one of the early chapters uh, deals with uh, what you call coming out. I wonder if before we deal with what coming out meant to you personally, if you could explain what coming out means in your terms. Well, coming out's used in two ways. The first way it's used generally is the acceptance or the realisation by a woman or man that they are predominantly homosexual in their sexual orientation. And that's a fairly long process. There are many cases, of course, of people coming to this realisation quite late in life. This seems to be more common among women than among men for various reasons that I'm not altogether sure of. The second meaning, and the one that I would tend to use it, is the process of coming out openly. That is of saying, I'm no longer going to lead the double life that most <coughs> homosexuals lead. I'm no longer going to pretend that I am in fact straight, I am going to be in public as I am in private, and people are going to have to accept me for what I am. And that is, I think, a political act in a society which regards homosexuality as abnormal and deviant and all the rest of it. And to that extent, may well be the guts of what co-liberation is all about. Well, that's an interesting point where you say it is a political act, uh, Mr. Altman, because um, it seems to me that one of the good things about your book, which however much I may disagree with it, is a obviously a courageous book. Uh, one of the good things about it is that it seems to me that you can, or interesting things, is that you confirm uh, some of the uh, conservative so-called prejudices about homosexuality. For example, most people uh, would say when uh, talking about homosexuality that it is a threat to society, say, and of course liberal-minded people say, oh, that, that is silly. However, you come along with your book and say, yes, that's true. Uh, we are a threat to society, we are out to uh, revolutionise society, to change things quite radically. Is that right? So you, in a sense you're prepared to agree with the, um, the Conservatives? I am saying a different twist. it is a... Th I wouldn't use the word threat. I'm saying that 
you and I would probably agree. Well, you, you do call it a challenge. Yes, you, you and I would agree on that. Mm. And what, of course, it's challenging is certain aspects of society that you and I may disagree about. For example, gay liberation, it seems to me, is a challenge to the masculine ethos that somehow sees um, something good in violence. It's a challenge to the idea that masculinity is proven by going out and beating up people. In many oh, cases, come, of course, come. beating you, up you, you go. Uh, that's not quite fair. Uh, uh, I mean, it may, that may be right, but when you issue the challenge in your book, you say, we represent the most blatant challenge of all to the mores of a society organised around belief in the family or the nuclear family and sharply differentiated sex differences. You, you're, uh, you're attacking more than violence. Oh, you're sure. attacking the family. And sure. Well, no... I'm not attacking the family as such. I'm attacking a concept which is that there is only one possible form of human happiness, and that is the heterosexual nuclear family. Um, I'm attacking the idea that all men must play certain roles and that all women must play certain other roles. So, to that extent, so of course, you think it's a, that bisexuality should be the norm? Well, now, that's something different, um, because we're talking here about two things. One is roles mm. and one is sexuality. I think that there's obviously a breaking down of sharp differences between male and female roles in our society, and I agree with that. I think that everyone is inherently bisexual. I don't think that because of this everybody need necessarily live bisexually. That is, I don't think it's necessary that everybody has to have sexual relations with both men and women. But do you think it's probably the normal thing and it should be accepted as the normal thing? I don't think I'd like to use the word normal. I, I think wonder if I might interrupt and ask you this question or postulate a statement that I'd like you to comment on that heterosexuality is part of normal biosocial development where homosexuality is always the result of a disordered sexual development? Well, that to me is plain nonsense. Um, I don't know who the source of it is, but it strikes me as being in the tradition of quite a long line of um, pseudoscientific writing. I which would in think fact not, is a if I may tell you. It, com it comes from a statement made in 1970 at the American Medical Association's hmm. convention. It was spoken by a man named Biber or Bieber. Right. Uh, and there was an award made for this particular presentation. Well, I'm not questioning any of that. You said pseudoscientific. Yes, I'm well, sorry. I think it is pseudoscience. I mean, the, f the fact is that plenty of people get awards for things that are not necessarily correct. Well, what makes a homosexual, Mr Altman? This is the point. Is it a disordered sexual development, or is it part of the norm of society? I think that it is obviously not part of the norm of society, <laughs> because society has decided to impose upon itself heterosexuality as the norm. Um, it seems to me that everybody has within them both homosexual and heterosexual elements, that most people for, I think, predominantly social reasons develop their heterosexuality almost exclusively, a minority develop their homosexuality almost exclusively, and a number of people, I don't know what percentage, are in fact both. Now, the sorts of things that you're quoting, um, and you're bringing up Bieber, um, has of course been attacked by other psychiatrists. This is true. And there is a, a big debate going on, as you're well aware of, mm -hmm. within the psychiatric profession at the moment as to whether in fact uh, Bieber's rather extreme views, and I say extreme because Bieber has in fact gone much further than the founder of psychoanalysis, Freud, ever went. There's a great debate about whether in fact this is um, a scientific view or just a rationalisation of existing social prejudices.